Cool. So um, I guess we'll do some introductions first. Um, I'm Rosie Lefebvre. I work at the University of Prince Edward Island, where I am the digital infrastructure and discovery librarian. And essentially that means I'm cataloging and metadata and systems. Um, we have a very small team of six librarians, so we do a lot. Um, and we also are the birthplace of Islandora, as you probably know. So we have quite a number of collections, um, everything from our institutional repository to a data repository. Um, we have a lot of digital archives. So for everything from maps, oral histories, um, a fiddle music project that I worked on, digitized community histories. Um, we also serve as a platform for running Islandora for institutions um, in the region who would like to use Islandora, but don't have the local resources to maintain it themselves. And we also have offered Islandoras to researchers. Um, and we have done in the past a lot of really custom work um, where we're offering people like Islandora, just you can do whatever you want with it. Um, early in, in early days, we developed a lot of really cool custom content models. So people were just putting like anything into Fedora and it was really amazing and really expansive. And uh, so it was a very cool project, but uh, now we're trying to tone that back a little bit and try to standardize things, uh, which hadn't always been done. Um, so as you can see, we've got uh, quite a number of sites running. I counted 38 active Islandora 7s um, on our systems, and that includes some multi-sites. So I counted each of the individual ones because they all have different you know, permissions and modules involved and stuff. Um, we are running two development sites using Islandora 8. Uh, none of them have been published yet, but we've got our digital herbarium, uh, which was prepared by Paul Pound, and the um, data repository uh, that was part of the RDM project, which I had been working on for the last 18 months. Uh, and that was done with a lot of work from Alexander O'Neill, Alan Stanley, um, Noella McIntyre, and um, Meng Yu Zhang. So we have, oh, sorry, um, we have a number of sites and they're all very, very different, which is kind of cool. Uh, yeah, oh, and you can reach me on Twitter at Rosie Lefebvre. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Darnell Melvin. I am the Special Collections and Archives Metadata Librarian at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, there, uh, in my role, I manage metadata activities. I lead the remediation uh, project, um, and I maintain our data models and our metadata documentation. Um, to give you a little background, um, we've been over 15 years of continued digitization activities, and we also service the special collections and university archives. Um, a lot of our projects can range from grant funded projects, GAN on demand services, and we have a bunch of different types of items in the current repository, um, born digital and digitized. Um, some of the highlights of our digitization activities in 2019 included 60,000 digital resources, um, resources which included the Union Pacific Railroad digitization project. We did some graduate student projects that accounted for 2,800 digital resources. Um, our photo collections accounted for about 8,000 digital resources and about 850 for scan on demand um, services. And then 72,000 pages of our historical news project um, and that's our partnership with LC, with the Chronicling of America. Um, our collections have been ongoing over time and like the control of metadata has been all over the place. Um, before 2006, minimal metadata may have been copied over from um, descriptions and mark records um, and or inherited from custom project-based databases. Um, and around 2006, um, Dublin Core was adopted 
Um, and then shortly after that, 2009, we started including um, descriptive metadata um, using uh, the source uh, for graphic materials. Um, and then in about 2011, we decided to switch over um, and use fast headings um, in 2011. And the, it's been really interesting because the data model has been getting more complex over time. It's been very simple, minimal stuff. And over time, we've been building it. Hi, so I'm Christina Spurgeon, and I am a data migration specialist at Lyricis. Um, and my role is to plan and carry out migrations from client systems to Islandora or collection space. Um, and I also do uh, programming uh, development to support these migration, that migration work. Um, and I am the data person, data slash metadata person in uh, working on planning migration of our Islandora 7 client instances to Islandora 8. Um, we currently host, provide Islandora hosting for 20 clients in um, separate Islandora 7 instances, and these vary greatly in size and content. Um, they include academ academic libraries, public library systems, and special libraries. Um, our smallest instance has 114 non-collection objects but it has 360 collections, most of which are empty and reflect an available archival collection from which nothing has been digitized. Um, our largest instance has over 905,000 non-collection objects and 923 collections. Um, and it's all in between there. Um, our clients range from institutions who have already begun asking how to remediate their metadata to prepare for Islandora 8 to extremely small institutions with no staff or resources available to deal with metadata in Islandora. That's why they have hired us. Um, we also provide migration services from Content DM or your homegrown database system or, or whatever it was into Islandora. Each of those migrations being a separate project with the end result that the way we have mapped that data into mods over time is very specific to each institution. So we see a lot of heterogeneity in how mods has been interpreted and applied per client um, in Islandora 7. Um, so we are not able to remediate the data for our clients. Um, and we currently are not in a position to sort of manage remediation projects. So we're in this interesting place of, of modeling and coming up with a profile for Islandora 8 metadata where we can move this data over and have it work in some way um, and work with our clients over time to improve that data, iterate over it, and improve that data and how it behaves in Islandora 8. Um, I think that's it. So I think at, at this point, we were going to open it up to see if you all had any questions for us and just basically have a discussion about what we're facing with this work. So one thing that I forgot to mention in my little intro was the um, I've been involved with the Islandora Metadata Interest Group um, as one of the co-conveners. And we have spent a while um, trying to essentially solve the mods to Islandora 8 conundrum. Um, what we had as a kind of goal was to create a mapping from mods to RDF. Um, assuming that we would be using RDF as our main metadata um, representation. Um, I guess what we found was that a lot of people have a lot of very different needs. And while we want to, you know, we want to be able to provide something that's going to allow people to migrate as easily as possible. 
but we also want to provide something that is flexible enough that anyone whose needs aren't met by that generic profile um, has the freedom and is it's as easy as possible for them to model their things in maybe a more complex way um, or using a different set of metadata fields. Um, Yeah, there are, so we have completed that work. We have a mapping document uh, that takes tags from mods and puts them into, um, says what RDF they're going to be in. Um, and one of the things that we are encountering is that a mapping from mods doesn't necessarily meet the same needs as somebody who is a Greenfield user coming into Islandora for the first time and may want to you know, create some content and then see a metadata profile that kind of makes sense that, okay, these seem like a reasonable set of fields to start with. Um, but you know, as, as a metadata person, um, I really don't want to lose a lot of the specificity that I've put into my mods. You know, we've taken a lot of time and a lot of effort and energy has gone into adding the annotations and the types and the attributes to all of our dates or names or other things um, within our Islandora. And so that like, if we keep all that granularity, then we suddenly have kind of a metadata profile that seems very mod specific. And that's not going to meet everybody's needs either. Yeah, that's really interesting because on our side, we're like on the flip side of the coin. We're not a mod shop, you know. Um, we we adopted Dublin Core early on, and over time, we've incorporated metadata from other namespaces for various reasons, including we included um, in our profile, we include premise um, for administrative um, um, services. We want to potentially do in our repository. Um, we've also included schema.org. Um, and with us being a special collections, we have a lot of um, information um, locked away in notes. And there's been significant activities trying to identify things that have been locked out, locked into these notes, such as relationships and um, various types of things like um, uh, services a, a agent may provide or um, the occupation of a person that we may be describing and want to represent in our RDF. Um, and so we, when, we dis when we have our metadata application profile, we had our local implementation, but yet we have, we think about metadata in a, in a longer chain of aggregation so we're, we're a member of the Mountain West Digital Libraries, um, which acts as our hub to the Digital Public Library of America. And so when we think about metadata strategies, we're really thinking about it in a larger metadata ecosystem. And we're really trying to describe things in a way that um, are very easy for not say a subject specialist could be able to, once we train them, we'll be able to pick up, they could pick it up and be able to describe their collections in a way um, that's um, almost like low hanging fruit, but yet we can, it, like, as Christina said, you can iterate over it. We look at metadata production in, a, in more of an iterative production. And so we might get the low hanging fruit this, this iteration through, but we're, we're constantly trying to refine our metadata and make it, more optimal, more inclusive, um, and um, yeah. Yeah, I would say at um, Lyricist, we're really focused on, well, well all of our Island Door 7 are very mod, it's all mods, so we're really focused on getting that moved over. And, and personally, I, I just, I found it odd that there's no sort of standard, uh, metadata format supported by Islandora 8 really that you can do anything that seemed like an odd flex for a you know heavily used in 
libraries and archives system. Um, in some ways it's great, in some ways it's been making this work really difficult. Um, I think um, we're sort of punting on the whole RDF link data piece of it for now. Um, because our client's main concern at this point is when they migrate, they want their items to display and the data to display and things to sort of behave as they have without losing functionality. Um, so making that happen um, is the top goal. And then possibly we'll also be a little bit farther down the line in what we can do with the mappings of the metadata into RDF. My understanding now is that it, it is a very simple uh, JSON LD is supported, um, which didn't seem to meet the use cases that I was coming up with. And we still don't have a good idea of what our client's use cases for the linked data function of Island or 8 is yet. So we have more to explore there. I am seeing that there's some question. There's a question in the chat on, um, especially for Lyricis and UNLV on where we are with um, testing, migrating metadata and what tools we're using or testing out. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read out the chat so that we have it in the recording as well. Um, so there was a, a long comment. Uh, some suggestions could be to start with DPLA map 4.0 or, or 5.0 or EDM profiles, since they are both widely acceptable, accepted profiles. I personally think mods loss is going to be inevitable, but I understand wanting to lose as little as possible. Uh, the question is, I'm wondering where you all are on testing mi migrating your metadata. What tools are you using or testing out? I see UPEI has two Island or eights in the development stage. What about Lyricis and UNLV? Do you have a sense of your timeline? Are you actively testing in I8 or focused more on remediation right now? Yeah, so as far as us at UNLV, um, we have a, um, a production, we have a production um, uh, online um, it's not to the public yet. We've been, Seth has been ingesting stuff. So basically my team has been remediating legacy collections and then we've been loading them in. Um, as of to date, I believe we have probably about eight uh, archival collections, digitized archival collections in our Islandora instance. And we're doing like um, U UI testing, um, and we're, we're really, it's more of a collaborative effort because we're part of a larger team of, a, uh, we're calling it this digital asset management migration team. And so we have people that represent it on um, our special collections technical services, as well as my department, digital collections, and then the web development team led by uh, Seth Shaw. Um, and so, um, as far as where we're at right now, we're about halfway through remediating our legacy collections. And so once we remediate, we put it in Seth's pipeline where Seth will ingest it um, and test it. And then once it's there, um, the entire team, um, including our um, UI team, will review the metadata, um, will make adjustments um, if necessary. Um, and, and it's more of an iterative process, um, consensus by team. And um, at Lyricist, we're in early, early stages of this. And the main focus so far is sort of on infrastructure pieces of how do we um, set up hosting for all of these clients. Um, I know Nigel Banks, who presented at the last Islandora Online has been doing work with us on the uh, the Isle uh, implementation and um, just, just how this is all going to work. Um, as I mentioned before, we are not going to be doing any remediation on metadata because it's not our data, um, so we, we can't do that. Um, so in terms of what where I'm at on this is just trying to get my head around um, what is in all of these instances. Um, so I'm using a combination of like solar querying to see which fields are being used, 
because you can use that as the proxy for mods. It's a lot faster. It's messy. Um, I down, have downloaded all the mods data streams and used a combination of a tool called Simile Gadget, a Ruby script that I wrote, and um, Mark Baggett's tool, Complex XML to open or find, which will flatten mods out into to CSVs um, to just explore what we even have um, in this metadata to, to sort of start getting an idea of what, what the needs are going to be in Islandora 8. And um, we have a dev, an internal dev instance of Islandora 8 set up where I've begun just messing around and learning what, what you can do with the metadata and using the metadata tooling in the Migrate 7x Claw um, module. Um, um, I see that there was a suggestion um, to start with the DPLA map 4.0 or 5.0. Um, did I just jump ahead for a question? Sorry about that. Um, yes, that would be really great, I think. Um, I would, yeah, so the reason, one of the reasons that um, the metadata interest group went where we went with our um, RDF transform is that that was kind of the way that we had been set out and we wanted to make sure that um, you know we could try to be as true to the existing metadata as possible so we also tried to get a sampling of what kinds of different mods people had um, and trying to just like understand what fields were being used um, was a challenge in itself. Um, thank you to Mark Baggett for that tool. That was extremely useful. Um, and like Christina said, we've also been using Solar, which, you know, if you know what your transform is, you can kind of figure out where in Solar um, those different elements will go. Um, why didn't we continue with it? I would love some help with this. Um, because what stymied me, and this is probably because of my perfectionist tendencies, um, was that the DPLA has a very strict um, like conceptual model of what a resource entails. And there are different things, if I read it off here, um, a web resource, an aggregation, a write statement, and a source resource all have their own metadata properties that can apply to them. And right now, we have an idea that there is one kind of node type that is an island or an object. Um, because we can do anything, it would absolutely be possible to implement um, DPLA or EDM using Islandora. I'm just not sure what it would look like and how many linked entities you'd have to create in order to be like one thing. Um, and this is maybe getting overly technical. Um, but there might be a way to get out of that in Fedora 6. Um, because one of the like, restrictions that we'd had is that if you wanted to have metadata about a different, uh, about a thing in RDF, uh, you'd essentially need to create an island or uh, an island or an, like a node or a, a content entity for that thing. Um, and while as a developer, that totally makes sense, and I can see doing that. Um, it would probably take a bit of wrapping in some sort of UI so that somebody who just has a thing and wants to create a representation of it doesn't need to learn how to go and create a resource, co create a source object, go create a this and that, and tie them all together in the exact right way. While they could do that, it would be really, really easy to do that badly, um, to mess it up, to forget a step or something like that. Um, and so we didn't want to put that kind of burden on the user um, straight out of Islandora. Now, again, like that is a combination of a modeling and a technical problem. So if that is something that the community is interested in, I don't see why we can't work towards that as a goal. But I also haven't used it extensively. Um, I know that 
you know, there are, you know, it's some institutions are DPLA pipelines or are part of parts of those pipelines. Um, so their metadata probably already some way conforms to that. Um, my understanding though was that institutions did enjoy um, having metadata that's a little bit more granular or more specific than what aggregators wanted to see. Um, and yeah, so we're kind of, we're, we're dealing with this issue of data loss, um, which we've been trying to avoid and we've, yeah. Um, I'm not sure as I don't want to force people to lose data um, and I especially don't want to force people to lose data and not know what it is that they're losing. So that's one of my concerns. Um, please let me know if, uh, but I think different people have different priorities, I guess is what I was uh, going to say, because of, you know, to us having our, having our metadata exist in ways that we can use it and edit it is our main priority. I think we're going to be using Drupal as our, um, our main focus, our, our presentation layer. Um, and we were not planning to expose our Fedora to the open world as a linked data um, platform. And a lot of that is because we have some kind of private data that we have previously stored in Islandora. Uh, we want to be able to keep that private information. So for instance, um, in our institutional repository, for every thesis, we've got signature pages and we don't publish those pages with signatures to everybody. We've got them locked down with exactly policies, but we want to keep the metadata about them. Um, or if there is uh, things under embargo or things that we um, just want to make sure that we limit like who can see what notes, um, we can do that in Drupal by having fields that are exposed to different Drupal users. Um, but so far, we haven't seen the ability to do that um, from Fedora in a way that's linked to what we set out in Drupal. And I don't know if my co-hosts want to talk about what their priorities are. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah, so for us, there, there's we have a couple, I wouldn't even say competing um, priorities. Um, but, um, we do have a bunch of different priorities for one, um, we are incorporating where we're, we're, we want our use cases, um, digital preservation, a system that handles large scale that could handle large scale, um, processing management, um, man that gives us management tools. Um, but as well as um, incorporating a special collections database and a special collections website, um, we're we want to incorporate on our user end not only a, a, a public. We're integrating a public user interface from, say, a, an alternative for our archive space public user interface, but we're also representing our digital repository. And so the first phase for us um, was getting our agents in there, getting our agent records um, loaded in, um, and then from there getting um, our descriptions in. And as we iterate through this, um, we're adding more and more of those relationships as we, um, as we um, remediate through our metadata, um, especially the notes that is being currently held in our team address server, um, that has everything from relation, all relationships of families, relationships from people to corporate entities, relationships from corporate entities to other corporate entities, and relationships of entities and um, geographic locations. Um, those are the kind of things that we want to represent in our island or instance. Um, and then moving forward, um, like I said, as we process more and more of these archival notes, we want to identify those things. Um, there's also been some um, um, research um, and um, a little research integrating uh, Wikidata also into our um, our data stream as well. So that's pretty much our uh, our pretty much the linked data is our thing. But uh, as Rosie mentioned, we do want our 
we want to focus also is our first priority is that user in and but we do eventually want to expose our link data and we want to build new products and services on top of that link data once it's exposed and i think our our priority is a little different it's a little split right we want to provide our clients with a system and a tool that works for them um, and we also, as an organization providing that service, need to do it in such a way that it is sustainable and like cost effective for us to do. Um, so like with Island Aura 7, because everything is mods, um, we in general just have one configuration that's propagated to all of our clients. Um, some of them do have some customizations on top of that, but basically all the indexing forms display um, stuff is um, pretty standard for everybody. And we want to sort of have the same thing going into Islandora 8, um, but we're not sure what, what that is going to look like yet, right? We want sort of, we're, we're working with Form Digital on a um, theme that will work better to uh, present collections based um, Island or content um, and we will want sort of like a basic basic functionality basic search basic faceting um, basic output to OAI PMH um, in display um, of one set of fields that will that will mostly work for everybody um, without having to sort of redo that and come up with a new profile for every client. Things that that will not be sustainable. Um. Yeah, one of the things that we're finding is really challenging is the number of different profiles that we have. Um, and yeah, it would be great if we could just kind of make one metadata profile that encapsulates in, uh, includes everything. Um, but I kind of don't really know if that's possible and don't even know if that's like what we really want to do. Um, yeah, so just to respond to some of the comments and questions in the chat. Um, what do you lose? You don't have to lose anything, right? You can put your mods file from Fedora 7 or F Islandora 7 um, into a media, link it to your Islandora node, and you'll have that data. Um, the way that we're doing it right now, it just takes the latest version. Um, so the first thing that you're losing is the old versions and the administrative tracking around those mods um, files. But you don't actually necessarily lose any of that actual nitty gritty metadata. Um, but as Christina mentioned, if you have it in mods, that doesn't mean that you can actually display it or fill on it or use it in views or other things because to do that it needs to be in a Drupal field and so what do we lose um, I can post a link to the mapping spreadsheet um, there are a number of fields that we just don't have a mapping for uh, for instance all of mods extension um, record info as well because partly that information is meta metadata. Um, it's about the, the content of this record. Um, so it doesn't seem like it should be addressed in the same way as the descriptive metadata, uh, which is what we focused on. Um, there are a number of mods locations. Um, So I know that a lot of people use mods location URL. It's a particularly um, recommended field, but it is often, and in many cases in Islandora 7, um, the Islandora 7 URL. And while we, like, we could provide a way to map that in, but we can't guarantee that that's actually going to be useful to you um, because you probably won't have this content at that same Islandora 7 URL. You might, if you have your sysadmin set up a whole bunch of redirects, but we don't really want to make that assumption. Um, 
there are another uh, a number of other like the physical location stuff um we found that within our sample data there was a lot of variance in how that was actually used and what that field really meant. Um, and that could be between institutions or even within institutions um, using the same field for different things. So we were very hesitant to A, say that they should all map into the same Drupal field, but B, to apply a semantic label by choosing an RDF predicate to say, this is what you mean by that. Um, in addition, for talking like semantics there, the physical location could refer to the object from which this was digitized, like the, the print book, um, and not, which is not the same conceptual entity as maybe the work that you're describing here with a title and an author and a publication date. Um, you know, I get it. so that kind of spills into like, well, why don't we go for a bib frame? Um, again, like modeling overload kind of hits in. Um, but speaking of like modeling overload, the main thing I would say that you are liable to, to lose if you do not customize your mapping are any of the extra attributes that you might use that aren't being used as selectors here in the map, uh, mapping, not to be confused with metadata application profile, sorry. Um, just because of like the structure of XML, it allows you to kind of say anything you want about those hierarchical things that you're mapping. Um, you know, people have used a lot of display labels, um, types for a lot of things, and a lot of those are really uncontrolled values. So there isn't a great way to do that in RDF or in Drupal unless you make a separate field for each of them. And that would result in a profile that nobody would want to use. So I think what, one of the things that we're fighting is we lose a kind of fundamental um, affordance of XML when we drop that and just go into fields or triples. 100%. I think you said that really well, Rosie. Thank you. And there was a suggestion. Um, sorry, let me just pull it up. That you could translate it on the fly or something. William Matheson, thank you. Um, I'm not sure what you meant by encapsulate, but we have kind of been throwing around an idea um, of developing something that would allow you to pull things out of that stored XML file. So if you, if you use the 7x migrate module and you've got your node with maybe just a few metadata fields filled out, but you've got the, the real meat still in your mods, um, something that would let me like configure, say, I want to put in this particular X path with all of my special attributes and whatnot, and then it could pull out the value and stick that in a field. Um, I think that'd be a really useful feature. Um, I think that it would allow people to kind of move forward, know that they've got their stuff, um, and then be able to progressively refine and improve what they have. And just on the, the sort of use case for RDF piece, I think um, I'll try to say this pithily. Uh, we've been having this sort of move over the years toward simplicity and maybe like not as great metadata for, for digital objects, right? And it, um, the, so the, the basic quality of our metadata often has has gone down over say like a mark record. Um, and then linked data sort of requires really good data quality for it to work, right? Like you need to be able to know exactly what this thing is and reconcile it to the right thing and connect it up to all the right pieces. So 
I mean, that is another reason why the, the linked data piece is not a gigantic priority for us right now, because there's just so much bare bones, maybe not related to any authority file um, data in a lot of these systems um, that we just can't do anything useful with it as linked data right now. And then maybe over time, as we can work on tooling for iterative reconciliation or pulling out from the mods or, or improving it, then it becomes more useful to work with it in that way.